Turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. We are going to continue a series on uprooting rejection. We're looking at the principle of rejection, how it forms roots under the surface and affects people in many ways. And uh, the point of this is we're believing God for supernatural deliverance and the power of the truth to set people free. Today we're going to look at a thought, and that is how rejection affects your money. And let's consider this from Proverbs chapter 11. We're going to read uh, our main verse, which is 24 through 26. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. Okay, rejection and money. Let's begin our first thought. We're going to talk about money and emotions. So, money is more than math. It, it helps to be able to count if you want to keep track of your money. That's, uh, that's a good thing. Money is not just data. Money is not just needs and bills. Okay, I'm going to make a statement. This is the foundation of this whole lesson. Money is emotional. You should write that down, get a tattoo, because it'll help you. I am kidding. Money is emotional. I know some of you are thinking, I know because when a bill comes, my money cries. That is not what I'm talking about. Okay, think about, here's the, the two statements that forms the basis of this lesson. Number one, you make money choices based on how you feel inside already. That's what that means. Money is emotional. Whatever emotions are in you, it literally affects what you choose concerning money. The second statement is what you do with money produces emotion. It makes you feel certain ways. So money is more than just how much you make, what your bills are, how much you have saved. Money is emotional. So what does this have to do with rejection? This is our series. Rejection produces emotion. We've looked at this in numbers of different ways. When you are rejected, you get a message of rejection, that is not just information. When someone lets you know that you do not have value, that you are not wanted, you're not loved, that's not just information that you file away in the mental filing cabinet. It produces things. And we've looked at this in various ways. It produces pain confusion, worthlessness, shame, anger, all kinds of emotions. In this series, we're dealing with things that can be under the surface. Those emotions can be buried under the surface. So, the reason why that is important is emotions affect your viewpoint. Whatever you feel ultimately is going to change what you see or how you see things. And so what we're looking at today, we're applying this in one simple area, and that is what you feel inside changes how you view money. That is very, very important that you uh, understand that. So, the text that we read, and we're going to read it again in just a, a moment, it answers two basic questions about money. Number one, what is the purpose of money? Why do people have money? What, do you, what is it supposed to be for? And secondly, how is money to be used? Let's, let's read our verse again, Proverbs 11, 24 through 26. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. 
Okay, this scripture is talking about different viewpoints of money. Scattering, generosity, withholding, uh, refusing. And so this is a purpose, a tool to help you for the future, generosity to bless other people, or is it all about you? So now rejection. So as I said, when people have received a message of rejection from anyone in their life in the past, now this is going to work out in how they view money, what is the purpose of money, and how should I use money. So think about this. Here's the first area. Let's talk about rejection and withholding because that's what our text talks about is some people, their view of money is withhold. Do not let it go. This, of course, is based on fear. For some people, their view of money, how they view it, it is absolutely connected to fear. That can be for various reasons. Perhaps it is that you grew up in poverty. People who grew up in abject poverty, they look at money uh, differently. Maybe it is that when you were younger, money caused turmoil in your family. The lack of money, a loss of job, uh, it was a fear, things were repossessed, you had to constantly move in, in, uh, or an inability to eat or to pay bills. That's what you grew up with. So that produces fear. Others of you, you grew up in an atmosphere of conflict over money. The number one thing that people uh, uh, fight about in marriage is often money. So some, some of you, this is what you saw. You saw your parents absolute constant battles over spending, not making enough money, not working. It was money. So what does that do to a person raised in poverty, raised in turmoil over money? It produces in some people an obsession with security. I don't want to feel like that. So I have to take care of the future in an obsession. Listen, taking care of the future is good. That is a wise thing. The Bible talks about that. I am not talking about using wisdom to take care of the future, which the Bible talks about, but people that this is based on absolute fear. I have to take care of the future, not simply because that's wise, not because you're providing Proverbs 6, the ant takes care, you know, winter's coming. That's, but some people, is, it is all about the past. The fear that is unhealed inside of them, I don't ever want to feel like that. I don't ever want to be in the position that my parents were in, so it then becomes an obsession. Look at Old Testament scripture, Exodus 32, 23, and 24. The people said to me, Moses, lead us out of Egypt, but we don't know what has happened to him. Make us gods who will lead us. So I told the people, take off your gold jewelry. When they gave me the gold, I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Okay, this is a, 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 an ancient story. Some of you, I don't know if you have any golden calves at home, but this principle is actually up to date. Okay, we are afraid of the future. Moses hasn't shown up, it's 40 days, we don't know where he went. So we're afraid of the future, so what we need is we need to secure the future, and what do they use to secure the future in their minds? Gold, money. And they make a god of gold. This is the problem when money is approached in an unhealthy way, it becomes a god. 
But the reason why people want money gods is often they're afraid. I don't want to feel like I felt in the past. I don't want to wind up like my parents. So this becomes an obsession, and our, our text says they withhold. If, if that's how you approach money and life, this kind of person, sometimes they will struggle to tithe, to obey God in the first 10% of their income. They will struggle to start tithing. Here it is, they've grown up, you've got to withhold, you've got to take care. They get saved, and then they hear preachers like, do what? Give away? <laughs> Why would I do that? Because if I give away, I will have less. So they struggle to start tithing. For other people, it's not the starting that is the problem. They're, every time the pastor preaches, is like, yes, I'm going to tithe until a bill comes. <gasps> a bill comes, so they stop. Because what if I don't have enough? This kind of heart sometimes will struggle to obey God and give. If you live for God, there will be specific points in time God will tell you to give, whether that's in an offering, a conference, to another person. God will speak to you, but some people, they struggle with that thought. Our text says, withhold. What if I give it away and I don't have enough for later? So now what they say is, God is going to put me in the position that my parents were in. God is going to put me in the position I was in as a kid. <laughs> no, 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 no. So they reject that. So this kind of person, they struggle with obedience. A person who is dominated by fear hates to spend for some of you, you can't relate. That's a foreign species. But there are people who hate to spend money because it's all about the future. If we spend, I won't have enough. Proverbs eleven twenty four. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Okay, withholding more than is right or more than is necessary. Listen, if money is causing conflict with those you love, there's a problem, okay? It's gonna be marriage, family, friends. Now, I am not talking about surprise spending. This is very common. Conflict in marriage is uh, husband or wife, they make major financial decisions without consultation. It's like, you went to the store and you bought a boat? That is a problem. You should consult that, that because that's a value. You didn't include me, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm not talking about that. There are people that if there is even the suggestion, you, you know what, the house is falling down, maybe we should and their spouse, there is an intense reaction. What? Freaking out. That's a problem. There, there's something wrong. You know, we, we should spend. We've saved, 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 saved. We've got the stockpile. Maybe we should buy something and enjoy it. No. Maybe we should do something. For some people, the idea of spending money. Listen, if money is causing intense emotional reactions with the people you love, there's a problem. If you're making everyone in the family suffer because you are terrified to spend, that's not a math question. It's not data. Remember my statement in the beginning? Money is emotional. The extreme version of fear is hoarding. There are people that their house is jam-packed. Their yard, their backyard is jam-packed with junk. 
And you say, no, it's good stuff. It's junk. It's broken. It's worthless. I can't let go of this stuff. What if I need that later? If it's been 29 years and you haven't used it yet, there's never, you have stuff you've forgotten you have. But, but this, this makes sense. But, but if I have it in the backyard, it's 29 feet tall, that pile there. What if I need it? Buy another one. It's only worth $3. Right? I could sell that for $17.50, the whole lot. It would cost you more to get someone to get rid of all the junk. So, but this becomes an obsession. I, I understand. I've never seen one, but I understand there's TV shows about this. In our church, Amador has a contract. I don't remember which government agency. They contact him when they have an extreme hoarder, and it's to the point of being unhealthy they pay him to come in, probably with a hazmat suit, and clean out. This is unreasonable. I'm not talking about, you, you know, you have a Monet painting in the back room. Hoarders. Uh, you know, I, I read a book about hoarding, and it talked about people, they're keeping fast food containers, takeaway food containers, wrapping paper, because... You never know. That's not math. That's emotion. So, withholding, the Bible says, that is how some people view money, is they withhold. Now, some of you, that's not your problem at all, is it? Let's talk about the other manifestation of rejection of money. That's rejection and spending. Some of you can't relate. Like, what kind of sick person would hold on to money? Because you view money very differently, but it's still emotional. Some people, they view money as a way to fix the negative emotions they feel inside. Remember what I said? Some people, the emotion inside causes them to make decisions. Other people, they're trying to fix those emotions because money makes them feel certain ways. Think about this. Some people use money as a drug. It's a drug. It is, why do people drink or take drugs sometimes to escape problems? Some of you, your problem is not alcohol. Your problem is not meth. Your problem is shopping. I'm sad, I'm stressed, I'm going shopping. Because my problems go away, whether that is going to the store, going to the mall, or going online, that's the problem these days that you never have to leave your house, is for a while, it's the thrill. Do you understand this? Buying stuff produces the same chemicals that drugs produce. Dopamines, feel-good chemicals. It's the same. How could that person be an addict? Oh, wrecking the family through their drug. Whoa, look at this. And you're online. Ding, you click. You're the same. You're an addict exactly the same way. Do you understand shopping is every bit as addictive as alcohol and drugs? Some of you, you, you could not go through a few days without shopping because you're addicted just like any other addict. Other people, they view money or they use money as medicine. The idea of medicine is to heal, right? You're in pain, I take pills, whatever it is. Some people in rejection, they have negative emotions. Rejection is 
an assault on your worth, your value as a human being. We've looked at this in different ways. So someone gave you the message that you are not loved, you have no value, I don't want you in my life. So some people now, because they have a worth or a value deficit, they use buying things to try and produce a feeling of value. We live in a strange world where people wear the labels of their clothes on the outside. Right? Because it's not enough to buy something of quality is you want people to know what brand you are wearing. Because this is a worth issue. I, I know people that they, you get in conversation, you, you, know what, you know what brand their suit is? It's like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> You're wearing it, not me. You know, you know my shoes? You know who made these? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Listen. If you're wearing nice shoes, you're not worth any more than someone who's barefoot. It didn't change your value. But you don't understand, these are Prada, Jimmy Choo. I buy a car of worth, so this changes my value. This is one of the huge mistakes of people in their purchasing is they're not buying, I believe in buying quality things. I learned a long time ago, I can buy a cheap thing and buy it three times, or I can buy something good, you know. I, I believe in, I don't, I, don't, I don't live by the principle of junk in life, but what you buy doesn't change your value. Listen, if you are a short, balding, overweight nerd, and you buy a really nice car, you didn't grow. <laughs> you don't have any more hair. You didn't lose weight. You didn't get cooler. You are a short, balding, overweight nerd with a nice car. That's it. Nothing changed. But this is the mistake of people Listen, I, I, I pastored in Africa. I saw people that were struggling to eat and they would go and spend an entire month's salary on a pair of shoes. <laughs> that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> because they're not buying shoes. They thought they were buying worth. And that is a terrible, terrible mistake. So, if you're using money to produce emotions or you're trying to fix emotions, you know what probably is going to be the outcome of your money use? Debt. You will spend more than makes sense because you are trying to fix something. Money is emotional. You have to understand this. This is why it's more than math. Math helps. If you make $600 a week, do you know how much you can spend every week? $600, that's it. Or if you make 1,000 or you make 500, 300, I don't care how much you make. If you spend more than you make, you're in trouble. And the reason why that people spend more than they make is often not because, you know, it's like, you know, my daughter needed brain surgery, so I had to, that's not why. It's because you were buying stuff to impress people. You were buying stuff because you were depressed. So you got into debt. Money is Emotional, final thought on that is that money 
Some people use money as competition. There's a saying we have in English, keeping up with the... Who are those Joneses? <laughs> we gotta, we got to talk to them. It is a competition. This is how people view money. Is It's not just I'm not buying it because I need it. Some people, how they view money is if I have more than you, if I have something better than you, I have worth, and I am worth more than you. I, I think I've told before, but Lisa and I, we moved in 97 to Johannesburg, South Africa. Because of the exchange rate, uh, we were living, we were paying for rent. I think it was only like 300 something dollars. It was the cheapest rent we had paid since we got married uh, years before. But it, we, you choose in South Africa because of security. We're living in a, in a cluster complex. Everything is about security. That means 37 houses on a common ground with 10 foot high walls, 10,000 volt wiring and, and security guards because it's, it's so dangerous there. So I was not raised with, uh, with money. Uh, you know, with, with Lisa wasn't raised with a lot of money. So we were now, to us, the exchange rate, we're, we're paying in American dollars. To us, it's cheap, but we were put with people who they now had money. And what was fascinating, where we lived, it kind of was a slope. Our house was like the second highest house so I could see the other houses from my upstairs window and, and I said to Delisa you know what I think our neighbors are competing like the guy three doors down he would drive in with a brand new BMW a few days later this neighbor would come in with a BMW convertible <laughs> this guy installed a pool in his yard. So this guy installs a pool with a fancy slide. And, and I say, I think they're competing. Is it? Nah, maybe it's just coincidence. We were hauling equipment back and forth in, in the church. It was beating up the car. So I asked Pastor Mitchell, can we buy a, a small trailer to haul the equipment so it doesn't beat up the car? He said, yeah, I bought a plain little trailer so that we had a cover so you could lock it. Remember, security. I came home with this trailer. The next week, my neighbor who lived across the street from me, he brought home a brand new double axle trailer with a nice paint job. <laughs> Maybe he needed this. Maybe, but, but this is how some people view money. It's emotional. I can't let you have something nicer than me, and that is an unhealthy way to approach money. So let's, let's talk about a second area, then we'll, we'll open it up in a minute. Let's talk about money and a poverty mentality. If rejection is someone's opinion of your worth or your value, and you're, you got that opinion from other people. You didn't decide that on yourself. Someone else told you or gave you the message in some way, you're no good, you're worthless in some way. That becomes especially destructive when you agree with that opinion. We, we've talked about it in other ways. People spend their lives fighting against that idea. Some people don't fight. They accept that and they say, yes, that's who I am. Yes, I am. I am worth less or worthless, have no value. This can play out, and this doesn't apply to every person in the world or every person that doesn't have money. Some people accepting the message of rejection plays out in in how they view money. So think about two manifestations. Number one is the guilt syndrome. If, if you got the message in life, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never be 
anything. But then in life, there are people, they wind up getting money. They got a good job or, or there was an inheritance in some way, money. Came. And so now all of a sudden, I can afford to buy decent things. I'm doing well in my job. I'm doing well in my business. If you don't resolve rejection, remember that is under the surface, this produces turmoil. On the one hand, I was told that I have no value, but now all of a sudden I am succeeding and I can afford things of value. This produces inner conflict. And so what some people, they come to this unhealthy conclusion, I shouldn't have this. I don't deserve this. Look at this, we can afford to buy what we want. We live in a nice house, I drive a nice car. I shouldn't have that. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Okay, this is a profound verse. The Bible says, when God blesses you, there is no sorrow that comes with it. In other words, it doesn't torment you. People who don't deal with rejection and their, their basic worth, when they do receive blessings, they don't enjoy them. It might be because of fear, like, okay, everything's going well. You feel like Wiley e. Coyote, when is the anvil going to fall on my head? Or I have known people that they feel compelled to give their good things away. I think I told you in a previous lesson, Lisa and I used to go to church in, in Australia with a guy that occasionally his roommates would come home and they would find all of his stuff in the trash. He bought sunglasses because he drove in the sun all day. He bought nice sunglasses that really protected his eyes, but then he would feel guilty. I don't need these nice sun. So he would throw them away. He'd buy clothes. Feel guilt, so he would throw it away because he had got a message that you don't deserve that. I have known people that they sabotage their blessing. They get a good job, and then all of a sudden they like miss work for a week. Or they punch somebody out on the job and lose their job. It's like, but that, that, that like happens over and over again. Sometimes it's because they don't feel right being able to make this money and have good things. That's the guilt syndrome. And then the second is the poverty syndrome. If you do not believe that you have worth and value, it's very possible that how you live financially will wind up matching your opinion of yourself. This is why some people, everything they have is low class, broken junk. It is filthy. It is a mess. This is not a money issue. Okay, I don't know if you've ever known this. You, you look at some people, if you look at their vehicle, if you see their house, Everything they own will be, it will soon match their opinion of their worth. They have a poverty mentality. And I have known people that they actually have money, but they live like they don't. And it's well possible, remember my opening statement, money is emotional. Why don't you fix it? Why don't you clean it? Sometimes it is because that's how they view themselves. So here's the, here's the problem. People with a poverty mentality, see, the, the, people go to university and they, they get 
indoctrinated. They think the problem in the world is inequality. What we need to do is anybody who doesn't have nice stuff, we need to give them stuff. I used to work, before I was a pastor, I was a, a glazier. I'm a glazier by trade, working with glass. And we had a contract in, uh, we had a housing commission uh, contract, and that is that we would work on government housing. So I would observe something. There would be people who were like really, really poor. They were living in, a, in an absolute hovel. It was trashed. So government, people who know everything, you know what we need to do? We need to give them a new house. So they would. They would move them from their trashed hovel and they would give them a brand new house. I would go to that house three months later, six months later, and their brand new house would be absolutely trashed, just like the trashed house they used to live in. Because their problem wasn't what they had or how much they were given. The problem is how they viewed themselves. And in short order, they made their possessions match their opinion internally. So this is why I'm teaching a lesson for some. This doesn't apply to everyone. I know that's an extreme. But this is something that needs to be healed. You have to heal how you view money. Okay, let's open for some questions or some comments. Bear, right over there. Could you say another way of what you're saying this morning is that you can't use money to bring spiritual deliverance, especially from rejection? No, no. You, that's, why, that's why I'm teaching this to Christians. You can, be, you can be saved and on your way to heaven and yet have areas of your life that are not healthy spiritually. And that's, uh, that's true. Carol? Up here. One time in the Ruth Street Church, Pastor Wayman Mitchell was trying to make a point and he, about money and how people view things. And he said, now how many of you in this assembly live in a dump? And I put my hand up and I looked around. There wasn't one person that had their hand up. I thought, that was long ago, so we've, you know, lifted in uh, success and so on. And it's like, I've been to your house. I know it's a dump. But the point is, I did live in a dump, but I didn't think that it described my character. Right. So God has helped me, but that's the way. You don't have to look at it that way. So yeah. I really have been appreciating the, the truth of all this lesson. Yeah, and, and please, uh, I don't want you to take what I'm, I'm saying about money as a, I think Pastor Greg is against poor people, okay? That is not, I've been poor, but that's not the point. I, I, again, I pastored in Africa. What was fascinating to me, we'd have people uh, who they lived in a tin shack, but when they came to church, they never looked trashed. They dressed neatly. There was a basic dignity about them. Okay, that, so that wasn't a money issue. They were living absolute poverty. So this is something that comes from within. That's my point. It's not how much you make in life. Good, somebody else. Betty? You know, after a person dies, you get to know a lot about them. My, when my mother passed away, she lived to 90. Four. And so we had to go and do the house and the garage and the shed and the everything. And I opened a box and there was wrap, Christmas wrapping paper from 1944, the year I was born. She never used it again, but everything was, and, and, and you know, things like uh, yogurt comes in. All those were washed and stored. We got to where we were afraid to even put out the garbage. We didn't want the garbage man to see us when he came. 
<laughs> Bill and I would hide because we expected the truck to turn over. It turned, and so I, I knew that my mother had a spirit of fear, the way that she lived, but after she had passed away, we actually understood um, who she was and what was going on in her life. My heart ached. Yeah. She was such a fearful person that she had to save everything, always afraid that there wouldn't be enough. Yeah. And that had, it has an effect on me. Bill says to me, would you please not throw away anything we just have to go out and buy? If I haven't used it in, you know, like a week, get rid of it. <laughs> but, because, but that is the opposite also. Yeah. That's not healthy either. But you learn a lot about what a person is after they die if you have to go through their things. Yes, which is why I did a lesson on preparing for death, and I encourage some of you to get rid of some of your broken junk now. That would be, that'd be a healthy thing. Let's talk uh, thirdly about a healthy view of money. So look at the road to financial health. The road to financial health is not based on how much you make. Okay, The road to financial health is actually not based on saving first. The road to financial health, my point, if what I told you so far is true, that money is emotional, you need to be healed of whatever pain is affecting your viewpoint. If pain is causing you to withhold, to hoard, as our text says, more than is right or fitting, you need to be healed of that. This is not, you know, as Betty just said, her mother saving yogurt containers. I mean, who knows how often those come in handy, huh? It's, it's not logic, is it? So th you need to be healed of that. If, if to you money is buying worth, if to you money is fixing uh, uh, stress or, or rejection, you can never be financially healthy unless you first get healed in here. And this, as I say, has nothing to do with your, whether or not you are a Christian or not. I know Christians who have a poverty mentality, Christians who spend, Christians who withhold. So the answer, this is why I'm teaching this series, number one, we need to be healed in here because what is inside affects outside. The second thing, and we're getting to this point probably our, in our final lesson, we'll deal with this in, in larger measure, but you cannot be healthy financially unless you have a correct view of your worth and your value. Once you settle worth and value, everything can be approached in a healthy way. You can approach relationships, marriage, ministry, relationship with God, because you're starting from who I am, and who I am is not based on someone else's opinion. It's not even based on your opinion. This is where we're headed in the series. Worth comes from God's opinion. And you have to get God's perspective and it needs to be a miracle of revelation. The third thing then, if you get healed and you know your worth and your value in God, then you begin to see money correctly. Remember I asked a question at the beginning of this. We read... Proverbs eleven twenty four, 24, and I asked the question, what is money for? What is the purpose of money? I don't know if you understand this. Biblically, money is a tool. It is simply a tool. That's why people have the extreme. If you have money, you're, you're somehow unspiritual. That's foolishness. The love of money is the root of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of evil. On the other hand, people that I'm spiritual, God must love me because I have lots of money. That's the Jewish mistake that Jesus continually dealt with. That's wrong. Money is a tool. 
Tools help you in life. That's the point of a tool. Tools help you get things done. Money as a tool, it can help you in the things of God. It can help you personally. And our text says it can help other people. Proverbs 11, 25 and 26. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. Okay, in this case, it, it says uh, and gives us the understanding that money will affect other people. Those who withhold, I will not release grain, people will curse you, right? If you're a hoarder, if you're a miser and it hurts you to spend money, there are people, they are really, really upset with you. <laughs> You're probably married to them. You probably live with them. Okay? So, because you withhold, withhold, it, it affects. Your money could help in your relationships, in your marriage. And then, of course, generous. Money's a tool. You, you need to have this understanding. If you have money, God did not give you money just for you. Built into having money is you should have an eye. First of all, what does God and the work of God need? But people. How can I help and be a blessing to other people because money is a tool? Second thought of seeing money correctly, God does not mind his children being blessed financially. And again, if you were raised in a background in a church that taught you that somehow, uh, you know, wearing rags and driving junk is somehow holy in the eyes of God, uh, you're not reading the Bible correctly. Abraham, the father of our faith, what does it say about him? He was very rich. Very rich. So that doesn't mean that our goal in life, everybody here, you all need to be very rich. But God is making a statement. The father of our faith, God didn't mind him having money. And as a matter of fact, God was the one who helped him get that money. Paul writes in the New Testament. He says in life, this is the balance. He says, I have learned to abound. I've had a lot. I've learned how to be abased. I've had a little or nothing. Life is like that, isn't it? But he says, I know how to abound. That's part of healthy living. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for his, us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Okay, graciously, I think this is the New Century version off the top of my head. I think the King James, New King James says, freely. So Paul has an argument. You ever, I, I meet people that, you know, I have a problem in life, but I don't want to bother God with it, right? I don't, I, I, we, we live in a house that uh, is not big enough for us. Our car is broken down. And, but, but I don't want to bother God with that. Paul makes an argument and says he didn't spare his own son. Right? That was like really, really expensive. So the argument is logical. If he's willing to give you the best, will he not also graciously or freely give you all things? I need a job. God says I can do that. God, we need a car that like makes it from point A to point B. He can do that. Need a house that can, we can actually fit in. Freely, this is how God views this. Final thought is the key to financial health and prosperity, our text says, is generous releasing of money, Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Okay, this is a viewpoint of money. I can, re this is farming, right? 
the farmer who has all the seed in the barn is going to be really, really poor. How do I get more seed? How do I get crops? I have to release. That is how money works. You will not succeed financially if you do not scatter or let go of. And then he says the generous soul will be made rich. If you water other people, you will be watered yourself. So you cannot succeed truly financially unless you first release to God. That is in tithing. That is in offerings. God deals with you. You let go of. And also part of that is giving to people. I'm not talking about people who are moochers and, and uh, they're wanting you to support their addiction. That's not what I'm talking about. But, but there are needs. If you live in life, you see a need. The Bible says when you help someone who is in need, you are lending to God. That means at a later date, you can say, God, I have a need. And God says, I remember how you gave away. You helped someone. Yes, I can help you. So this is the logic of money. Money is a tool. Heal what is inside. Get a correct view of your value. And then you have to release. I want you to bow your heads. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you to pray. I know we're dealing with some of these things will be in the future, but I'm going to help you to pray about your money. I want you to say this out loud. I want you to say, Father God, I need you to help me to see money correctly. I need a healing on the inside so that emotion is not dominating my financial decisions. God, my worth comes from you. And I'm asking you, deliver me from fear. Deliver me from rejection. Help me to trust you. Help me to be generous and have a correct view of money. And I am claiming your help and your blessing in my finances. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. We're going to stop there. Our service will begin at 1030. God bless you.